So I think I should clarify, um, in this audience, I'm not a real doctor like an econ PhD, I'm just a medical doctor. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I do agree with one of the previous speakers that we should have let the economists rule the uh, country over the last year. They would have done a better job than the physicians did, to be honest. Um, so I'm a direct primary care physician, so I'm kind of living on the front lines with a lot of the things that y'all have been hearing about today. And so um, I'm really just going to walk you through our experience. Um, I'm not going to talk a ton about our company specifically, which is Big Tree. Um, I feel like I'm more of an ambassador for direct primary care in general. Uh, if somebody wants to take me out for dinner tonight, I can tell you how our company is a couple steps beyond that, and we can fix everything in the universe, or at least healthcare. Uh, but we'll save that for later. So this is more a talk on what DPC is and how it works, okay? Um, I'm a doctor. My medical school was a, um, we used a lot of case studies for our educational process, and so that's kind of how I think. So we're going to walk through a case today. And this is a real person. Uh, we're going to call her Tracy. So uh, this is Tracy. She actually came up to my mother at church and was asking my mother's advice, who is not in healthcare and has no idea, um, which of her medicines she should stop taking because she couldn't afford them, okay? She is a uh, type 2 diabetic. She has high cholesterol and hypertension. Um, and I simplify this quite a bit. She was a little bit more complex than that. She has about a $3,000 deductible and a $15 generic medicine copay. And her copay on branded drugs is 30%, all right? She is a um, lunch lady at a school, okay? So she makes $11 an hour, which is, uh, in her county, the median income, right? So half the people in her county are poorer than that, right? So this is her reality. Uh, in the first little column, these are types of services she gets. And then the next column is the contractual price with her insurance carrier, which we work with, so I could actually know those prices. And then this is her, the next column is uh, how much she was paying. And then the final column is how much her um, self funded health plan was paying. Okay. And then we'll transform that once she joined Big Tree in a second. So the first, she was paying $335 every three months for visits to a cardiologist and an endocrinologist. She was paying $125 once a year to see a primary care provider. Twice a year, she went to urgent care, $250 a pop. Uh, she had um, $115 every three months in lab costs. And then she had $145 for her oral uh, diabetic meds, $47 a month for her hypertension medicine, and $330 a month for her Jardiance, which is a branded uh, diabetic med. Okay? And you can see how much she was paying for those, which is basically $388 per month, which is... Uh, uh, I think in the next slide, yeah, so that's 32% of her disposable after rent income was going to her medicine on a monthly basis, okay? So she's a single mom, and she was trying to figure out um, how to afford her kids going to college, and so that's why she was trying to figure out which med to dump, okay? So um, Big Tree is a direct primary care clinic, which means that we receive payments directly from uh, patients, usually as a monthly fee. And then that just puts us on your team. So then we get to be creative and help you solve your problems and help you lower your costs. And we like that as doctors because I'd rather my creativity go to helping you figure out how to get better care for cheaper than to going to figure out how I can hack the insurance billing system to get a level five instead of a level four out of that 15 minute visit, which is how I used to play the game. So when Tracy joined Big Tree, her net result was that her total cost went down to about 10% of her disposable income. So we did that by um, several factors, and that's kind of what we're going to go through step by step. But on the first one, the $335 every three months for the hypertension management and the diabetes management, you know, when I was in medical school, I was really I was flabbergasted as at least half the time when I was following a cardiologist or an endocrinologist or a gastroenterologist around, I couldn't figure out why the patients were there. And I, I was, so I asked one of them, you know, why on earth is this person on two hypertension meds seeing a cardiologist? 
cardiologist said, I don't know, but they're quick and easy visits for me, so I just see them and bill them, right? And what a lot of primary care doctors do, like myself, is if the person gets a little bit complicated, or God forbid they want to ask about two questions at the same visit, well, you punt them off to a specialist, right? Because I've got a waiting list months long to come see me, so I just need to keep the easy people. And if it gets any complex at all, it's in them to the specialist. Specialists don't mind because those are quick and easy visits for them, and they get to bill higher prices because they're usually part of a monopolistic health system, and everybody wins, right? Except, except some like Tracy. So we manage those in-house, right? So those costs disappear for her, all right? Um, and so her net result is she drops from 388 to $125. Now, if you do all that math later on, which I'm going to go fast, so you won't be able to, you'll notice the numbers don't add up, okay? And there's economists in the room, so they're going to catch on to that. And that's because of something called rebates. And if you haven't got to play with the pharmacy benefit managers and rebates, um, you, we could talk about that over dinner too, but that's a whole other conversation but it always works as one plus two equals 12, okay? <laughs> okay, so why primary care? Uh, why monthly payments? Well, in the fee-for-service health system, payments are for a service. So if you come into my office, I'm a pediatrician by training, so you bring your two-year-old into my office, I look in their ear, I see acute otitis media, I prescribe you amoxicillin, and that's a 99213 or a 99214, those are the CPT codes. And I have a contractual rate with each payer for a different amount. It might be as low as $25 if it's a managed Medicaid or up to $115 if it's uh, a payer that does not have a lot of market power, okay? Now, my job then is to figure out how to get that number as high as possible, right, so I can make more money. Of course, doctors don't do that, <laughs> except they do. Right, office managers do that. So... Really, though, primary care is not about that. Primary care is about access, continuity, and responsibility. And we see this, it's about access, because if you get sick tomorrow, you want to be able to go to see your doctor and get care. It's a crazy concept. In my community, my sister-in-law is a primary care physician and for a major health system, and she's allowed one slot a day for people who call in sick. Right? Why would they do that? Well, because if the health system sends that same patient to urgent care where they see a nurse practitioner, so lower cost structure, and they get to bill more because it's at urgent care, they get to make more money. So they purposely limit the number of primary care providers so that they can make more money off the urgent care system. So primary care is about access, but if you want access, you have to pay for it, right? So if, if I save slots open in my book so that you can get in when you need to get sick, that means some days those are not going to get full. So if you want to be able to get in when you need sick, I need a payment to make that happen. So that's why we like monthly fees rather than straight fee for service. Okay? Primary care is also about continuity. In the billing system, a 99214, which is like an office visit, is the same whether you're seeing me or one of my partners, or one of my partner's partners, or my partner's partner's partners who you've never even heard of. We get paid all the same. So there's no compensation for seeing me again. There is actually increased compensation if you go see somebody new because then they get to bill on 99204, which is a new patient. So the incentive structure is for you never to see the same person twice, okay? So again, if you want continuity, well, you, you do have to pay for that, right? You guys are all good uh, Austrian economics people, so you want to pay for that, and so that's a monthly fee. Again, this is why I like monthly fees. Finally, primary care is about responsibility. We all know this is true because if I send somebody with chest pain to see a cardiologist, he does a few tests, he sends me a letter and says, I don't know what it is, but it's not the heart. Go see who? Your primary care physician, okay? Well, you realize there's no way that I get paid for that, for holding that responsibility, right? So if we, the system is designed for the urgent care to proliferate and primary care to die so that there is no access continuity or responsibility. So the solution, we believe, is a monthly recurring fee for me to be on your team, 
okay? Now, what's really cool about that is that allows me to be creative. And so some of the ways that we've been able to be creative, I'll get back to us being creative in a second. So there's several models on how this is happening right now in the marketplace, okay? So the first one is the uh, MD VIP model. So you may have heard of this called concierge medicine, okay? So concierge medicine and direct primary care, we like to think of those as different. Uh, MD VIP is kind of the quintessential concierge medicine, typically concierge medicine. Um, those physicians have about 300 or so patients on a panel, and they typically bill well in excess of $1,000 per year for access, and then they also bill your insurance fee for service on top of that. Okay, so the, the fee is just to get you in the door, right? Uh, that does allow those doctors to have a smaller panel, so they're longer visits, um, but in general, it's the system you're used to, except you pay extra so that that doctor limits their practice, okay? Then there's groups like One Medical, which is uh, publicly traded under O-N-E-M. Um, I do definitely hold shares in that, um, though I don't give financial advice either. So those uh, practices usually have about 800 or so patients per provider. They bill a small fee for access, about $200 per year, and then they bill fee for service. And I stuck a little asterisk on there because what they actually do is they go into cities and they contract with the most monopolistic health system in the city, and they'll typically get extremely high fee for service rates, something on the order of $350 for an office visit. So it's a very profitable system, uh, but it's really just a slight extrapolation of the old system. Um, then there's kind of the federation of independent DPC people, okay? And I kind of fit into this group a little bit. Um, there are some in every one of your towns. There's about 1,500 of them in the United States. DPC Frontier is a website you can go to and look up where these people are. And they'll generally charge about $60 to $125 per month for unlimited care. And they usually have a limited practice about 800 to 1,200 patients. When I was in private practice, I had 2,500 patients on my panel, just for context. So then there's a more corporate side. So there's a uh, private equity-backed company now called Everside. It was originally called Paladina, and they merged with the other two larger players in the United States last year. And they'll charge in the $39 to $70 range, and it's designed to work with employers. Okay, so Big Tree, which is my company, is kind of halfway between those last two groups. Uh, and then finally, there are several of these companies have gone public recently, um, and they are Medicare Advantage plans who have a direct primary care uh, emphasis. And Iora Health is kind of the one that I think of here, but there's others that have gone public recently too. Uh, last week, One Medical and Iora merged, interestingly enough. So there's a lot of activity on the VC and private equity side in this space, and I expect to see a lot more. Okay, so is there data on this? You guys are data people. Yes, there's data on this. So the Society of Actuaries uh, published a report last year uh, where a Milliman uh, sponsored study on direct primary care. And what they found was that the total cost of care on a per member per month basis went down by about 13%, okay? And uh, that was on a risk adjusted basis. How did that happen? Well, this is the you know, the fancy graph from their slides. But look at the arrows. So one is their emergency department utilization went down by 50%. Um, they also saw a reduction in their urgent care visits and in the, uh, the physician primary care specialist visits. All right. And that was not statistically significant in this section, though we find it really meaningful. The statistics can't tease it out because you build the same codes, whether you're a specialist or non, and so there, that really sh should probably show an increase in the primary care visits and a decrease in the specialist visits. In our experience, uh, it's been pretty meaningful. So back with Tracy, um, so we eliminate her office visits to the specialist, we eliminate her urgent care. A group that's been with us for a year had zero urgent care visits in the last 12 months. Right, and saw a reduction of $700,000 in their total medical spend for a group of 200 people, which is pretty, pretty fun. Um, and her primary care cost, she was on one of our virtual plans, so we, don't have, we didn't have an office in her community, so it was all over our app, 
and it was $44 a month was her cost to get her, our services. So the other thing this does is it creates the ability for us to be creative. So this is her lab cost. And so a quick story on this. So we were at the very beginning, uh, like a good Austrian economics person, I said I wanted to know how much these things cost. Uh, so I can tell my patients what their labs cost. So I called around, and none of the hospitals would tell me what the labs were going to cost. They refused to tell me, right? So Quest uh, sent me a packet in the mail. So I opened the packet, and it has a contract in it, which sounded which was very odd. And I start leafing through the, the list, and they just seem way, way too cheap. And... So I had just sent a patient for a lipid panel, and it was $77. So I flipped over the lipid panel, and it said $2.42. And so I, I called the Quest rep up, and I said, I, I, I don't really know what, uh, what this packet is. I wanted to know the cash price list. And she said, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I, was, I sent you the wrong list. And I'm like, well, what list did you send me, right? <laughs> and she says... Oh, that's our client pay list. I'm like, I'm just a doctor. I don't really know what client pay list means. And she's like, oh, well, that's if you pay on behalf of the patient, that's how much we charge you. Really? I said, well, how, how much do I have to charge the patient? She's like, oh, it's great. You can charge him anything you want to. I'm like, all right. I'd like to sign that contract. So <laughs> we signed the contract and a complete blood count at big tree is two dollars and 42 cents okay and so then i just pass that on to the patients right so this was a this is an actual patient uh she was in one of our rural communities and she had an allegiance to her hospital and said i want to go to the hospital to get my labs done and we said you don't want to do that and she said i believe in this community and for this community a week later, she calls us back yelling at us because she had to pay $111 for her three lab tests. And she got a complete blood count, complete metabolic panel, and a thyroid stimulating hormone level. Okay, super normal tests. She's like, well, what, how much would it have been if I went through Big Tree? $11. Okay, $11. So the markups on these things, so those were those three tests. So they had a markup of 800%, 600%, and 1,000% on those tests. Okay. It's crazy. That's like buying a 10-cent hot dog at the uh, ballpark for $150. All right. That's, that's kind of what that translates to. So, but that's what, so we have uh, clinics in, we have virtual-only clinics in 26 states, and we have those contracts then in all those states so that our patients can get those lab prices um, in, those, in those places. Um, the pharmacy section is more interesting, though. If you all have not done a deep dive into pharmacy benefit managers, um, you all would love that. That's such an educational experience, especially if you have a lot of hard liquor involved. Um, so the, we're going to go into that because it's worth it um, briefly. So this is um, a list of six common medicines, okay? Some of the top 50 medicines prescribed. I'm sure many of you in this room are on some of these meds. Um, with the number of annual U.S. prescriptions, they're in the red circle, and the average retail price, which is a completely meaningless number, okay? Now, below that, in the first of the graphs, are the actual cost that a local pharmacy benefit manager was charging for those drugs. So when we started Big Tree, we were uh, buying an exam table. I was searching around, and the person I was buying them from, McKesson, actually had drugs, and so I started looking at the actual price of these drugs, which I'd never seen. You know, I'm a doctor. I don't see these kind of things. And it was appalling. And so we looked in to see if we could actually start buying drugs and dispensing them directly to our patients. And Missouri actually has a law that allows that. Some states do. We scaled it up, and now we actually own our own pharmacy. And then we just charge the patients the actual cost of the drug. Okay. So look at this. So... A uh, month of Losartan is $2.10. A month of Atorvastatin is $1.80. The PBM was charging $26 for it. Um, uh, Prozac was $0.60. Cents. Uh, a Z-Pack is $2.40. A round of Augmentin is $5. We had this lady that's intermittently homeless that one of the social service agencies brought to us. 
and she was just got out of the psych ward, and they took her um, to the Walgreens to pick up her drugs, and it was going to be one thousand one hundred dollars for her um, antidepressant and an atypical antipsychotic. Okay, we got them for six bucks. Okay, that's a meaningful thing in her life, right? Six versus eleven hundred dollars. So we just charge them costs, and for our corporate clients, we just throw in all the generic meds for free, okay, because they're so inconsequential in their costs that it's, we just do it as a sales tactic. Um, okay, and then the last one is the Jardians, and this one's the little, one that's a little bit complicated, but you guys are econ people, so you, you should enjoy this, all right? So what is Jardians? Jardians is a diabetes med that has been demonstrated in research to also lower your risk of cardiovascular disease, right? Super great. Um, costs about $330 a month if you got a good discount, uh, close to 800 if you don't. So why do we use it? So this is the actual graph that comes from uh, one of my texts on how to pick a diabetes med. All right, so we're gonna walk through it step by step. Just kidding. So. <laughs> The important thing for you guys to realize is over there on the right, you see that circled thing? If you can't read it, it says uh, cost is a major issue, <laughs> okay? So you, part of the decision-making tree is, is cost an issue, right? So all the stuff on the left is if cost is not an issue, right? And like, <laughs> is cost not an issue, okay? So, but look at the difference. If you go on the cost is an issue side, it's $1.80 for step one and $25 a month for step two. If you go on the cost is not an issue side, it's $736 or $529 for step one, you get to choose. And then you do the other one for step two and then step three is $336 a month. So when I'm talking to Tracy, I'm a doctor, not an LPN at an insurance company, right? Making these decisions, which is how it actually happens. So I said to Tracy, I said, Tracy, do you know why I would choose the left half of this versus the cost as an issue? She said, no. I said, well, the only reason is because one study showed that Jardians decreased the risk of people with prior heart attacks on having another heart attack by 1%. And she said, well, I've never had a heart attack. I said, I know. So I'm guessing it might decrease your risk of having a heart attack by maybe 0.25% and it's costing you $100 a month, not to mention your payer an extra $200 a month. She's like, well, why in the world am I taking this? And I said, I have no idea. And so she stopped it, and we used the $25 a month option. And in the end, she went from paying $338 to just under $100 a month um, was actually her cost. And that's a meaningful, life-changing experience for her. Right, she's making 11 bucks an hour scooping, you know, fries to kids. Right, why on earth? Fully insured, mind you. Okay, so this is the power of direct primary care. It puts me on your side. I get to be creative and solve your problems, not figure out how to game the system. Okay, so uh, last slide, this is a DPC map. So it looks like there's a bunch of us out there. Um, this is all of them in the country. But that's actually about 1,500 clinicians, which if you assume about 1,000 people, that's enough to care for about 1.5 million Americans, which is um, not enough, okay? So that's why Big Tree exists. We're trying to scale this up, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. Um, but I really think this is the core for the future. So if we want to do cash pay healthcare, this is the core to solve the problem. So thanks for your attention, guys. Thank you.